I hope that prayer comes true. Amen? Amen. Okay, now look, you know, I mean, most of you have had COVID and most of you have dealt with it. And you're here and you probably are not that scared. So I'm going to let you greet each other, okay? So stand your feet, say hi, get to know each other. Take some time. All right, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. Uh, you know, a lot of people talk about the Lord's Prayer actually in the Sermon on the Mount, our Father who art in heaven and so on. Um, that's actually the disciples' prayer. That's our prayer. It was the prayer that the Lord gave us to teach us how to pray. It's a, a template. But this is actually the Lord's Prayer. This is the prayer that Jesus prayed for you and I. This is <clears throat> the heart of God revealed uh, in the communication between the Father and the Son, which, you know, boggles your mind when you actually think about it. But this is, this is literally what Jesus prayed for you and me. Okay? So, <clears throat> uh, I got to go back home and, and uh, hang out and so on and so forth. And one of the pleasures that I had was to be able to actually go to my grandma's house at 34th and Tennyson. And 34th and Tennyson is four blocks from Old Elitches. Does anybody know what Elitch is? No, see? Okay. So Elitches is the world's of fun of Denver. Okay? Now Elitches used to be four blocks from my grandma's house. So I used to love to go to my grandma's house because I could... As soon as I got there, I'd be busting out the door, go four blocks down and play skee ball and, you know, all that. And uh, so anyway, I got to go by and see my grandma's house. And turns out that it was in the middle of being rehabbed. So I got to go inside. And, uh, you know, uh, man, the memories that flowed through my mind because my grandma Mason... Uh, she had a, a large impact on me. She was a businesswoman. She was alone. Uh, my grandpa Mason passed away early. Uh, he was actually older than her. She ran three businesses in Denver. Okay. And she didn't even have a car. Yeah. Because grandpa was teaching her how to drive and she ran into the side of the house. <laughs> and so uh, he, he, they called him Red Mason, his his because he had red hair. And uh, so he, you know, he said, uh, Angela, you're, get out of the car. <laughs> and, and he never let her drive again. I'm not saying that's right, but that's the way it went. And uh, so long story short is that um, it just really brought a flood. And uh, so what I found out is, is that that house is being rehabbed to become an Airbnb. Yeah. But <clears throat> when I walked in there, you know, so many familiar things. But what it really brought to me was is how much um, my grandma taught me faith, taught me work, you know, and took care of me. And I wasn't even actually her birth grandson, say. So all that comes 
comes to mind. And uh, I decided eventually I'm going to get a hold of the lady that's rehabbing that house because in those kind of Airbnb type things, if they have a theme, it sort of lends to people's desire to stay there, you know. And uh, in my office, I have a uh, Rocky Mountain News, 1959 Rocky Mountain News, and it says, she steps into man's shoes. Okay, which that they would burn the newspaper for that article today. But because she was the only businesswoman on Colfax Avenue, so to get a context for this, from the start of the belt to the end of the belt, she would be the only woman that had a business. Okay, now this is Denver, it's a little bigger, and so in 1959 she was the only businesswoman that actually ran her own business. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a hold of the lady that owns the house, because the guys that were there were rehabbing, you know. And uh, I said, hey, I've, I got a story for her. I'm gonna, how, could, you, could you give me her number or something? And they said, no, we better not do that. And he said, you might want to wait a little while to talk to her. I said, why? She because she's mad. <laughs> I said, really? They said, yeah, it's only supposed to be four months, and it's been 11 months rehabbing this house. <laughs> and so she's, she's really ticked off. <laughs> so anyway, long story short is, the Lord's Prayer, so, you know, you get to be brought into, okay, what the Lord actually thinks, what the, what the Lord actually cares about, what the actual mind of God is for you and I. And so this is a deep inner view of what it is that the Lord cares about and what he prayed for us and what's important to us. And, uh, you know, this is the very nature of who we are. Now, I want to kind of start off by taking a moment from Matthew chapter 9. We're going to be in John 17, but in Matthew chapter 9, <clears throat> Jesus is just looking at the people. He's looking at the people. And in verse 36, this is what it says, And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were what? harassed and helpless. The very nature of God is compassion. Uh, I, I think that there's a lot of harassment and helplessness going on. And the trouble was is that the sheep had no shepherd. The sheep had no shepherd. Those of you that ever take care of animals, you know, of course, a lot of you got domesticated cats and dogs and that kind of thing. Well, they don't take care of themselves. You have to take care of them. You know, if you don't, then they'll get sick or they'll get hurt or they'll tear something up and so on and so forth. You have to, you really have to care for them. And uh, that's true for all of us. So, you know, the trouble that we're all having is the actual absence of a shepherd. The actual absence of a shepherd. I was teaching my granddaughters uh, about money. Now, it's really not money, it's just currency, but I won't go into that. But on the currency, I was showing them all the things that are on our bills, you know, and explaining it to them. And I said, and look at this, you see this right here? And of course, Harper can read, you know, real good. And so I said, what does that say? In God we trust. I said, did you know that our country used to and still in some ways values the fact that God is who we trust in? And so we explained that and went over that and so on. And that's the, that's the reality here is that we need a shepherd. We need a shepherd. And one of the things I, I've noticed is that Everybody is sort of because they're so afraid and they're so disturbed and they're so frustrated that everybody's kind of going their own way, doing their own thing, and that just isn't going to work. That just is not going to work. And, um, you know, we have to have a shepherd. A committee of shepherds doesn't usually work either. But I want you to see Jesus' heart. So turn with me to John chapter 17. Verses 1 through 26. 
Are you with me? Okay, good. And just so you know, I always use the ESV. Uh, I, I trust it. And I, I switched a long time ago when other translations decided they were going to put their own opinions in the Bible. And that's not translating. That's paraphrasing or even uh, actually um, changing the Bible to what you want it to say. Verse 1 says this. When Jesus had spoken his words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. I think that kind of gives us an idea about where we ought to look. And said, Father, the hour has come. The hour has come. You know, I did a wedding yesterday. And all these details come up to this one minute, <laughs> you know. And you, you want to make sure everything's in order, you know. So I, I asked the, the attendants, I was like, okay, now you got the rings? Yeah, you got the rings. Okay, all right. Now, music man, you got the music? Yeah, you know when to play it? Yeah, you're going to shut the doors? Yeah, shut the doors. You know, I'm not a detail person, so weddings are not my favorite thing. And there's a lot of emotion to all those details, you know. And, you know, I mean, I've learned over the years, you know, of doing so many weddings, you know, now make sure you get her dressed and you hold her flowers. Make sure you give her flowers back to her and stuff like that. I mean, it's just detail, 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 detail. And notice here, the hour has come where the fullness of all of God's purpose and work comes to fruition. This is a big moment. Glorify your son. Now, several years ago, I really began to see my God as my father and to see myself as his son. You, I suggest, since Christ is our leader, you should see God as your father and understand yourself to be his son or daughter. That makes a big difference when you think like that. Jesus always referred to God Father, and Jesus is always Son. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh. So who has authority? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. He has authority. Do you know a year ago, we were all down in the south end trying to help people that were completely flooded out? Do you remember that? Yeah. And I remember this one gentleman when I walked up to his place and he said, what am I going to do? This is all I got. Everything he had was underwater and destroyed. Who has authority? We look at our apps to see what the weather's going to be, but that doesn't even tell us what the weather's going to be, does it? Amen. Uh, I will tell you one nice thing about my vacation is that I was at 50 degrees in the morning and 70 degrees in the afternoon, and I'm sorry about what you were doing. <laughs> I had somebody working on my house, and they sent me a text. Couldn't you give me a little air conditioning while I'm in there? Because <laughs> you know, I had to, you know, said hi. But anyway, so... You know, this reality is that Jesus has authority over all flesh. Over all things. Everything. Uh, one of my favorite phrases is, God's got this. That doesn't mean it's going to go my way. The way I expect. But I have to trust him because he's the one that has authority. Now, just remember this. this is not, not, I, I don't want people to think what I say has something to do with politics or anything like that. But look, <laughs> people do not have authority. This world does not operate according to any collective man or woman. It is God who orders things. Now notice Jesus has authority over all flesh to give and what is it that he gives? Eternal life. 
I think we need to get back to what we're really about, my friends. We're not about comfortable life. We're about eternal life. We're not about long life. We're about eternal life. Jesus lived how long? 33 years. You think he got ripped off? He didn't get 85, he didn't get 90. We have to remember, this life is not what we're all about. You have to remember that. This is a breath. When I don't like the way things are going, I try to remember that. You know, this winter, when it gets back to the weather I like, <laughs> okay, you can have this stuff, I don't care for this. But when it gets back to that, when we step outside, guess what's going to happen every time we breathe? There's going to be a fog, you know. <laughs> we'll freeze to death. Yeah, not me. <laughs> but, you know, do you worry about that? You're like, oh, man, that breath got away from me. Oh, it's gone. No, you don't do that. You don't think like that. So we need to remember that Jesus is, is communicating with the Heavenly Father, the Godhead, is communicating together, and it is understanding that all this is authority was to be able to give eternal life. Not temporal life, eternal life. Authority over all flesh. To all whom have you have given him. And this eternal life, that they know you, the only true God. So what is eternal life? How do we find eternal life? By knowing the one and only true God through the Son that he gave to reveal it and to accomplish it. And this eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Now think about your life. What is your work? To do what the Lord has given you to do. To accomplish what God wants you to do. You think you work for your employer. You think you own your business. But in actuality, you work for God. He is the authority of all flesh. Everything belongs to him. Uh, one of the interesting things when I was there in Colorado, I've been going to Grand Lake for a long, long time. I've been going to the Rocky Mountains all, all my life. But I have never seen what I saw this time. 423,000 acres completely scorched. Scorched. There are no trees. There are no grass and there are no animals. I thought, I was walking with Essie, and we were just, you know, I mean, you're just taking it in, because I've never walked in this before. I've never been where everything is completely burned up in the mountains like that. And I thought, I mean, the literal thought came to me, Gehenna, which is the word for hell in the New Testament. And what desolation it really was, you know? Do you know that um, they couldn't stop it? Mm -mm. And who, you know, why did it go here and not there? And why did, it, you know, tornadoes the same way? You know, just, just level the ground. The point here is this. God has all authority. And our job is to do the work that he has given us to do. To do the work that he has given us to do. He says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory I had with you before the world existed. So again, even understand, this world has not always been here, and it is not always going to be here. Uh, my son Seth was explaining to me, he's been witnessing to this 92-year-old engineer who doesn't believe in God. And he was 
teaching on the book of Revelation. And in the book of Revelation, it talks about how the sun and moon will pass away. Okay. And suddenly, this 92-year-old engineer had a realization. And what he realized was this. How did they know that the earth and the moon were passing away? Did you know that the sun is burning up? Uh -huh. Did you know that the moon is degrading in its orbit? Do you know that the earth is degrading in its rotation? Do you know that everything is breaking down? Are you with me? Am I doing too much for you? You know, I mean, maybe you need some lunch, you know, so because I'm putting some deep thoughts out on you. But the fact is, is that everything is breaking down. And this 92-year-old engineer said, how'd they know that? To which my son said, the one who made it. And there he goes, oh. So you can still learn things when you're 92. Amen. And the reality is for you and I to understand is that this world that, that, that we have is not lasting, it's not permanent, it's not what it's all about. It is a place where we learn and grow to understand the one who made it. And so Jesus is wanting to glorify the Father with the glory that he had before he came in human flesh. Before anything existed. And that's a deep thought. But verse 6 says, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Now I want you to, under, I want you to get this. Out of the world. I like the phrase resident alien. Resident alien alien. That's what I am. I am a resident alien. Okay? That means I reside here, but I don't belong here. This is not my home. I will not spend all of my existence here. I belong to another country I am a citizen of God. And you and I need to remember that those that God the Father gave to Christ the Son, He gave to them, not in this world, but to bring out of this world. Okay? We always talk about the fact Jesus said, I'm building a mansion. What for? For us. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you and bring you where? Where I am. And this is important to understand because, you see, if you focus too much on this world, you're going to miss what it's all about. This is not what it's all about. Jesus said, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have what? kept your word. So this is really important for you and I to remember. You know why so many people attack the Bible is because that's the centerpiece of our actual growth and discovery of God. The actual word of God. Uh, you know, I was telling you about the thoughts I've had about my grandma Mason. She believed strongly in work. Now, she was a good Missouri woman. Did you know that? She's from the Hannibal area. So she's a good Missouri woman. And uh, she believed in hard work. So I was uh, a trumpet player for about two minutes. And <laughs> I learned two songs. <laughs> Home on the Range and Bumblebee. <laughs> if you know what those are. Court probably knows. But anyway, so I figured out on the streets of Colfax Avenue that if you played a trumpet, people would give you money. I'd seen other people do it, and I was like, well, I'm going to do that. So I went two doors down from my grandma's shoe shop out on Colfax Avenue. Of course, this is back when people walked around, too. 
And I opened up my case and I played Bumblebee. You know, I mean, it's not really a Chopin type piece, but. And guess what the people did? They put money in my case. I was like, well, I like this. This is good. I'd taken, what, one lesson? <laughs> and I'm making money. So, you know, and then I'd change it up and play home on the range. <laughs> you know? Anyway, uh, a lady went in my grandma's shop and she said, Angie, I put some money in your grandson's case. I just think he's so cute. And my grandma goes, what? She's, yeah, no, he's playing his trumpet out there on the street, and people are putting money in his case. Well, my grandma was not happy about that. She literally marched out of her shop, came two doors down in front of the bike shop where I was at, because I wasn't going to do it in front of her shop, you know. And she grabbed me by the ear. <laughs> and put my trumpet in the case and barely shut it and drug me down and put the trumpet away and said, no grandson of mine is going to what? Panhandle. That's what she said. She said, if you want money, you're going to. Mm -hmm. And that's the day she showed me how to nail, glue, trim, and do all the work on shoes. That's when I began to actually, now here's the point. The Lord called us to keep his word. And my grandma was bringing me into the word of understanding, bringing me into what life is about according to her. And God has given us his word, and we are called to keep it. It's not about you and me making life the way we want it. It's about adjusting ourselves to the way God called us to live it, to keep his word. And so the Lord is praying that we have received this word and that we would keep this word that was given to us through the authority of this name that God the Father gave to the Son and the disciples that the Lord gave to the Son, and that these disciples would have eternal life and keep God's word in this world where they don't belong. And this is our Lord's prayer. Now notice, verse 7, Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. So this is a point of stewardship. This is a point of ownership. Okay? Okay? If I borrow your car, whose car is it? Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's yours. I don't know who I was with recently. I used their car. Yeah, yeah, it was a friend of mine. And the first, the, and I, I said, can I drive your car? I'd like to try it. And so this, yeah, yeah, you try it. And when I got in it, they said this. Now, look, don't hit the throttle too hard because there's some problems. <laughs> and I was like, okay, yeah, no problem. You know. Now, why did they tell me that? Because it's their car. Now, what if I got in there and the first thing I did is hammered it? That would be irresponsible of me, wouldn't it? So here's the thing for you and I to remember. Everything we have came from God. Everything. And we must recognize our stewardship of all that he has given us. My life does not belong to me. It was given to me. And I need to be a good steward of the life that God made and gave to me. And verse 7 emphasizes Jesus praying, Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth. Now, I want you to get this. So, have you ever had somebody, you tell them something, and then they don't do anything about it? And what do you say to them? Did you hear me? Didn't you, did you hear me? 
Now, why are we asking, did you hear me? Because they didn't do it. So hearing is only the beginning. And if there's ever one thing I've noticed about my life and about a believer, that is, a lot of us know the Word of God, but keeping it is sometimes far from us. Especially when it's painful. Especially when it's painful. But not only did they receive the Word, but they knew the Word because they kept it. That I came from you and that they have believed that you sent me. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world. Did you get that? Jesus is praying for you. Jesus is praying for me. Man, I like that. I like that. I'm praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, but they are where? In the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name. Okay? In your name. Now, when you're baptized, you're baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you see. We pray in Jesus' name. I come in the name of the United States. I come in the name of the Lord. To understand who we are, what is our relationship, and what is our authority. This is what Jesus is actually establishing. Remember, God the Father named his son and gave him the name. And at that name, every and what? Christ is Lord. So this is very important for you and I to believe and to glorify this name. Believe and glorify this name. I'm praying for them, he says. I'm no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Now I'm coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be what? One. One. Uh, the whole point of our vacation this year was to actually bring all the kids together, my wife said, this is what I want for our 40th anniversary. And guess what? I'm listening. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, if she's telling me something she wants after 40 years, I'm paying attention. And she said, I want all of us to get together in Grand Lake. So, you know, I was already in agreement. She had me at hello, <laughs> you know, because I love going home. And so, anyway, so got all the kids together in Grand Lake. Amen. So everybody's in the same house together. Everybody. Can you imagine any challenges there? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the Lord has called us to himself, and we are his, and therefore he wants us to be what? One. With him and with each other. Now, this is something I, I really want to emphasize to us. Do not allow this present trouble to cause this church to be divided. Don't do it. Every one of you has your opinion. And, you know, Lord, we spend all our time talking about it. But the fact is, is that it's not about your opinion or my opinion. It's about God's opinion. And when we got one shepherd, we're all together. Amen? We're all together. And being one is what the Lord is actually interested in for you and I. So he prayed for us that we'd be one. Even as they are one. And I've said this to you before and you need to understand it that the Trinity is literally 
the example of how we should live. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the three are one. One. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you gave me. Now notice this. The name you have given me, I have guarded them, and not one of them has been what? Lost. Uh, one of the challenges of being together as a family, uh, my son Seth's little girl, uh, Annie, she is a gadfly. I mean, that little girl, she is, you've got to keep an eye on her. I mean, you look away from her for five minutes, she'll be on top of the mountain somewhere. I mean, she is gone, you know. And so, you know, you're constantly, where's the, where, 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 you know, where you at, where you at? And so the Lord actually is guarding us to keep us and not be lost. Jesus kept his disciples, and he will keep us. Now, one, of course, but that was a, a son of destruction. And he said that the scripture might actually be fulfilled. So Judas was never actually a part of things. He didn't lose it. He never had it. And so the Lord actually keeps us. And this is important to understand that everything might be fulfilled. But now I'm coming to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What is the joy of Jesus? What is the pleasure of the Son? To glorify the Father. That is his joy. I, I brought this tomato because, you know, I was looking for one of these before I left. And uh, I couldn't find any. <laughs> I was like, wow, there used to be tomatoes up and down the belt. I mean, it was not hard to find them. Whenever I go to um, Colorado, I always get Missouri tomatoes and take them to my Aunt Sue. She loves Missouri tomatoes. Okay, I'll just tell you, Colorado tomatoes are not that great. All right? They don't get juicy and big and all that kind of stuff because this is a different climate. So, I wanted to take my Aunt Sue tomatoes. I imagined that they would be all over the place the end of July. I went up and down the belt. I could not find one person who had tomatoes. I'm leaving in the next morning. I got no tomatoes. Now, yeah, I could have put a message out there to everybody and said, has anybody got any tomatoes? And then I would have had so many tomatoes, you know. So I was afraid of that because, you know, that'd be overkill. Plus, I didn't want to waste your tomatoes. So I was just trying to find someplace I could get some tomatoes, you know. And so one of our members told me about a guy that had tomatoes. And I was like, oh, okay, good. I, I, you know, how do I do this? Well, you just tell him on Facebook. So long story short is, I worked it out with this guy, and he actually met me in a time that was not his time. You know what I mean? So he opened his store for me, specially, so I could get some tomatoes. And so I, I met him at his place, and, and uh, I said, well, I'll take two boxes, you know. And uh, so, <laughs> and then we got out there, and I put him in the car, and I was so happy, you know, I'm going to be able to take my Aunt Sue some tomatoes. She loves tomatoes. And I got two boxes because I know that she would like handing them out. Not only eating them, but also what? Giving them, sharing them with all the other people in her building. And so the time comes for me to actually pay for the tomatoes. And uh, he said uh, something about a six and a five. And I was like, oh, okay. So I gave him a $10 bill for two boxes of tomatoes tomatoes that are about, well, it's about 15 in each box, so about 30 altogether. And I was thinking, oh, I'm just going to, you know, he opened special for me and everything. I'm just going to let him keep the change, you know, because I was thinking $6.50. So <laughs> I gave him 10, and uh, you know how this kind of transaction stuff goes on. He's looking kind of confused at me, 
And he goes, no, that, that's $65. There was an explosion that went on in my head. I was like, am I being robbed here? <laughs> I have never paid $65 for 30 tomatoes in my life. Anyway, it turns out these are organic, special, and all that, you know, certified and whatnot. And boy, that's your thing. Good for you. You better make some good money. But anyway, but here's the thing, my friends. Here's the deal, okay? I didn't flinch. You know why? Because I'm going to get my Aunt Sue some tomatoes. And I am not going to go down that road without some tomatoes for my Aunt Sue. Why? because I love her and I would do anything I would pay $65 for what I consider to be $10 tomatoes <laughs> because now here's the thing to remember the Lord loves us and has provided for us and we belong to him and he gave everything he has for you and I because he loves us. And because he loves us, we, because of the love of God, want to do what? Give him everything we have because that's what the relationship is all about. I'm running out of time. I can't do the whole passage, but the reality is is that the Lord Jesus prayed for us that we would be in his word, that we would not be of this world, and that he would keep us, and that we would be one, and that we would, of his love, love one another, and then show that love of God to the whole world the way we love one another. And I want to encourage you and I to understand today, John 17 is the Lord's prayer for us. This is what he desires for us. So I think it's something that we should pay attention to because this is what he purposed us to do. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together. As we, th as we sing, think about this. The Lord is willing to pay anything for your tomatoes. Amen? Amen. And as we sing that, think about his love for you, think about what our real purpose is, and think about the purpose and unity that we can all have together as we work together for him as we sing this song. Come out of sadness, wherever you've been, come broken heart, rescue begin, come find your mercy, sinner come you, earth has no sorrow that heaven can be, earth has no sorrow. Deacon here today. Brian, you gonna fill out? Okay. Close this out, brother. Morning. Morning. My name is Brian Weed. I'm one of your deacons here at Green Valley. And just like that song comes, you are. If there's something going on in your life um, that you're ready to get some help on or partner with somebody, make sure you contact the church office this week. They'll get a hold of one of us, and we'll come alongside you. So.
As we uh, leave here and go out into our mission fields, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to gather together in your building on your day to hear your message. And, Father, to, uh, to be reminded of the Lord's prayer this morning and, and uh, just to, to keep your word, Lord, and, and to, uh, imply, or to, to impress your word upon our hearts, minds, bodies, and souls, Father. We are your children called by your name. So as we seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, Lord, help us to keep your word. Help us to shine your love before us and those that we come in contact with. So, Lord, as we leave this place today and go into our mission field of life, Father, I pray that those we come in contact with that are in need, Lord, that they see you through us, that you can give us the words to say at that time, Father. Help us to live the life to be the example that you want us to be. And we ask these things in your Son, our Savior's name. Amen.